This is Module 8, Protein Metabolism. In this video 8-1, Protein Degradation, I'll be describing some of the mechanisms by which your body digests proteins to turn them into amino acids. Now, your body doesn't use proteins in this form for um, oxidation and generation of ATP. It will use amino acids. And so the oxidation of amino acids for the use of ATP production will be discussed in video 8-1. In this video, we'll be, I'll be describing how proteins are broken down into amino acids and what the fate of those amino acids may be. Up until this point, we've been talking about metabolism for the last two weeks, but we've only really been focused on glucose metabolism and the pathways associated with what I call central metabolism. And so that would be glycolysis, which is pictured here in orange, the transition reaction when we turn pyruvate into acetyl-CoA, and the citric acid cycle, which is pictured here in green. And then these all generate cellular energy through the reduction of uh, electron carriers, so NAD to NADH, or FAD to FADH2. And so what powers both of these pathways is the entrance of glucose into the cell, which is then phosphorylated through glycolysis, um, and then it's allowed to proceed you know, through central metabolism. However, glucose doesn't necessarily represent the only high energy molecule that can be oxidized to produce ATP. Amino acids can be oxidized um, and turned into one of the intermediates of glycolysis, um, or they can be oxidized, turned into pyruvate, or oxidized and turned into different intermediates of the citric acid cycle, and thereby powering central metabolism. Um, however, proteins have to first be broken down into amino acids before that can happen. And so for this video, I'll be describing what happens in this arrow right here. During this semester, I will not be talking about how nucleic acids can be broken down and funneled into central metabolism. However, um, in module nine, I will talk about how lipids and fatty acids can be broken down and oxidized to, and funneled into central metabolic pathways. So for the remainder of this video, I'll be talking about just this part right here, how proteins are degraded into amino acids and under what circumstances that occurs. What makes proteins unique compared to glucose and lipids is that proteins cannot be stored and used for later. And so the fate of a protein when you um, consume protein is either break it down into amino acids and use it to build something in the body or break it down into amino acids and use those amino acids for um, creation of ATP. So oxidize those amino acids to make ATP. You cannot store proteins. Um, you can store fat pretty much um, with no upper capacity, no upper limit. You can store fat pretty much any, indefinitely. Your adipose tissue is very good at um, incorporating new fat droplets. And you can store glucose in the form of glycogen for about, I think it's about 2,000 calories that you can store in, um, in the form of glycogen. But proteins, you either use it or you lose it. Um, you cannot store it and use it for later. And so proteins will undergo degradation to amino acids in three metabolic circumstances to perform and fulfill three different functions. The first is normal synthesis and degradation of cellular proteins. Enzymes that are made during metabolic reactions or receptors that are made, any protein that's made in the cell will go through a recycling process. Um, sometimes proteins get damaged or they become irreversibly attached to a molecule that inhibits them. And so your body will recognize these as proteins that, sh that are not functioning or are functioning in a toxic way and have to be degraded. Um, so, you know, the, um, we, so when you have to build new proteins, you'll degrade yeah, you'll degrade proteins into amino acids and then build new proteins, or you will just degrade um, existing proteins um, into amino acids as part of regular um, uh, cell turnover. Um, another metabolic circumstance is if you are consuming a protein-rich diet with ingested amino acids that exceeds the body's need for protein synthesis. So if you are consuming a high-protein diet, but you're not... Um, you, you don't have a requirement for muscle building or, or enzyme building or anything like that, you're already getting all of the other things you need to build those, then your body will um, degrade proteins into amino acids um, and then um, um, uh, degrade them or expel them. <laughs> 
um, through waste products, sorry. So dietary protein digestion begins in the stomach. When proteins hit your stomach, gastric juice will break peptide bonds. So you get um, long protein polypeptides broken into shorter, poly, um, shorter peptides. Um, and then there are enzymes present in the intestine, the small intestine, that continue to break peptide bonds, cleaving them into single amino acids. Um, and these enzymes are secreted by your pancreas. So they're like pancreatic uh, proteases. Um, another situation in which you would degrade protein is in starvation or uncontrolled diabetes. When you don't have access to stored glycogen um, or the carbohydrates you are consuming are not properly utilized, they're not being taken up by the cell. And so under extreme starvation conditions where you have no fat to access and no um, carbs to access, you will start to consume your own muscle tissue. So you'll break down proteins in your muscles into amino acids and then oxidize those amino acids to keep ATP levels high. Um, and so these are the different metabolic circumstances in which you would degrade protein. Protein degradation also function, and so by doing that, they function as a way to provide energy in times of metabolic need. And so in this situation, when you are starving or when you don't have access to glucose, you will um, degrade proteins into amino acids and then further oxidize them to create ATP. You also degrade protein as a way to eliminate abnormal proteins whose accumulation would be harmful. And so that's part of this metabolic circumstance. Um, if you have proteins that are acting in a toxic way, um, your body will eliminate them, degrade them into amino acids. And then typically those amino acids are used to rebuild a functioning protein. Um, and so that brings me to function number three, which is uh, your body will degrade proteins as a way to create new building material for other proteins. And so you degrade proteins into amino acids, and then you use those amino acids to build muscle tissue, um, you know, any, any protein in your body is, um, is made this way. Okay. There are two different mechanisms for degrading proteins in the cell, in the cell now. So material has to be moved into the cell. So proteins, small peptides have to be moved into the cell. Um, and then they are further degraded either by lysosomal degradation or proteasomal degradation. Lysosomal degradation occurs when proteins are taken up um, through binding to a receptor. And so there's a specific receptor that will bind proteins and then they will be incorporated into the cell through endocytosis, so engulfed, much like a macrophage engulfs a pathogen. Some of those proteins will then be selected for degradation depending on the metabolic circumstance. So if your body actually um, is starving and you need to break those proteins down to amino acids to use to, to make ATP, then they could be signaled for lysosomal degradation. And so lysosomal degradation is a situational circumstance. Sometimes um, your body requires an increase in protein degradation, and so that would activate the lysosome. In other situations, the lysosomal degradation rates are very low um, because you don't have a metabolic circumstance that warrants it. Um, so, very, so proteins are selected for degradation um, when you're fasting or starving or when you don't have access to glucose or glycogen. Um, and then the proteins are selected based on a protein sequence. So these um, five amino acids have to appear in this order. And then that specific residue is recognized by chaperone proteins, which are floating around the cytosol, that will bind to this residue and transport it to the organelle called the lysosome for degradation. And just to refresh your memory in case you have forgotten, um, lysosomal, the lysosome is an organelle in the cell, a membrane-bound organelle that houses proteolytic and, you know, actually not just proteolytic, but hydrolytic enzymes, meaning enzymes that break bonds. And so in the lysosome, you'll find nucleases that break bonds that hold together DNA. You'll find proteases that break peptide bonds that hold together proteins. And you'll also find lipases that break um, um, the bonds that, that hold, so the, glycos, the ester linkages that hold um, fatty acids uh, together. Um, and so we have to make sure that those hydrolytic enzymes are housed within the lysosome so that they're not just floating around the cytosol, bumping into things and breaking bonds everywhere. Um, so they have to be sort of sec uh, sequestered away from everything else so that they don't cause unnecessary cellular damage. By the way, CMA is chaperone-mediated autophagy. So let me just add that in. Okay. 
The other circumstance is just general protein turnover. And so proteasomal degradation functions at a constant rate um, and uh, just helps to turn over proteins, breaking down old proteins to create new ones, and also recognizing toxic proteins, breaking them down to create new, better functioning proteins. And so proteasomal degradation happens at a constant rate, basically all the time as part of the general maintenance of the cell, whereas lysosomal degradation is only activated in response to a metabolic need. So first I'm gonna talk about um, lysosomal degradation, which is also referred to, uh, uh, which um, occurs through chaperone-mediated autophagy. The term autophagy refers to the body's way of degrading its own tissues um, for use in energy production during starvation and other um, metabolic need circumstances, a low energy state. Um, okay, so chaperone-mediated autophagy, or CMA, is mediated by a, a specific receptor found on the surface of a liver cell. And so this protein degradation is happening, this specific type of protein degradation is happening in the liver. So once again, another really important role for the liver is um, protein degradation through CMA. Um, the receptor it binds to is called LAMP2A. And so cytosolic chaperone proteins that are floating around in the liver cell cytosol. Um, oh, sorry, so I, I jumped ahead. So here we have a protein that's... Um, oh, so, uh, sorry. Okay, pardon me, I misspoke. Um, the LAMP2A is not found on the surface of the liver cells, it's found on the surface of the lysosome, my mistake. Um, but these are only present, these LAMP2A receptors, and this action is really only happening in the liver cell. All right, um, and so a cytosolic chaperone protein, so um, these are the yellow circles here, will recognize this KFERQ motif on an engulfed protein. And so the protein has been engulfed by the liver cell. It's now floating around in the cytosol. Um, and then the chaperone protein recognizes this particular motif, the KFERQ motif. And so that's the red string here. The chaperone protein will bind it and then transport it to the LAMP2A receptor on the surface of the lysosome. And so this is all happening within the liver cell. Um, once the chaperone brings it there, that will cause. Um, more LAMP2A receptors to aggregate around this bound protein. And so you get a large protein complex in, uh, as a result of binding that first one. Um, once the complex is, so once that occurs, the complex will um, move the protein into the lysosome. So it will um, unfold it and move it into the lysosome as a single primary structure polypeptide. Um, and then within the lysosome, proteases will bind peptide bonds and break them resulting in the formation of single amino acids. And so this means the amount of LAMP, so the regulation of this process is through the amount of LAMP2A that's bound on the outside of the lysosome. So if there is a lot of LAMP2A, that will increase CMA, so chaperone-mediated autophagy. Um, if there's less LAMP2A, then um, that will decrease. And the amount of LAMP2A depends on um, hormone signals in the body that signal starvation or fasting. So now let's talk about proteasomal degradation, which as I want to remind you is the general turnover of regular of proteins or toxic proteins in the cell. And so this is happening in every cell in your body as a part of just quality control, cell maintenance. Um, and so uh, this helps to control um, um, the presence of certain proteins. So for example, if you if you have a hormone signal, a steroid hormone that's in the cell um, that's activating gene transcription in response to stress, you want to be able to degrade that protein so you can stop the stress response. And so your proteasome will do that. Um, and it also will degrade any defective protein that was maybe folded improperly, something like a molten globule would be recognized by the proteasome and degraded as it's toxic and needs to get out of here. Um, so the proteins that are going to be degraded are marked with a molecule called ubiquitin. There's a small pro protein present in every cell, and so this, this process will occur in every cell. Um, do not confuse ubiquitin with ubiquitone, which is the um, coenzyme Q 
electron carrier that's part of the electron transport chain. These are very different molecules. Okay, so for so um, um, in order to signal a protein to be degraded by the proteasome, there needs to be four total ubiquitin molecules linked to the protein. Um, and so we go, um, that would be called a polyubiquitin molecule. So here we have the target protein and we have two linked to it so far. And so this protein would not yet make it to the proteasome. It needs two more ubiquitins in order to, to uh, create that signal. This process is ATP dependent. And so um, you do consume ATP during this process of, of degrading proteins. And so the general turnover and quality control process in the cell requires ATP to work. And so this is why you don't rely on this mechanism during times of starvation. You don't have any ATP, and so you wouldn't be able to do this. So let's take a look at how this works. Here's a protein that's been tagged with four ubiquitin molecules. And here's the proteasome. This is another um, organelle within the cell. And so there's lots of these little proteasomes that exist in a single cell. Um, this will bind to with the cap one side of the proteasome. And so it's got two caps on it like this. It will bind to one of the caps. And then ATP aces within the cap will use a molecule of ATP, which um, releases energy enough to drive the, fold, the unfolding of the protein. So this is a folded protein. Um, in order to access all the peptide bonds, you need to unfold it to its primary structure. And so that's an ATP dependent process. And so as the protein enters the proteasome, it's unfolded into its primary structure, which exposes all of the peptide bonds in that protein. Proteases within the proteasome will recognize peptide bonds, break them, um, and then release small peptides or amino acids as the result. Um, ubiquitin molecules, before the ubiquitin has a chance to enter in the proteasome, the bond that connects the ubiquitin to the protein to be degraded is cleaved, and then the ubiquitin is released in the size cell and recycled, reused. Okay, and so, um, so now we have been able to degrade proteins into amino acids. And so this is occurring from proteins from your diet through the process of digestion. And so that's going to be mostly your proteasomal um, uh, action. And then there's also, uh, actually, no, not necessarily. This would happen. Um, um, both mechanisms do both of these things. My, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to mis misspeak there. And so your lysosomal degradation and your proteasomal degradation will degrade cellular proteins and proteins found um, consumed as part of your diet into amino acids. Those amino acids can then be absorbed um, or that can be used to build new proteins. And so you break them down into amino acids and then just build them back up into other proteins like enzymes, receptors, hormones, muscle tissue, what have you. Um, during times of starvation or when you have an excess of amino acids where you've built all your new proteins but you still have extra, the remaining amino acids will be catabolized um, and oxidized as a, uh, in order to create ATP.